when I went down to Barbary Coast then, it reminded me of Belmain, all these little pubs like built out of brick and stone and that. They're just these little pubs all in a row, about, I don't know, six of them or more. The Barbary Coast was something that everyone knew was there when you were a young fella. Uh, unless you were with your parents, you never went anywhere near the place. It'd be mud wrestling on one hotel, you know, it's just, a, and all the girls would be in there, and <laughs> they'd be being paid, and boys would be betting on the, the mud wrestling scenes. And it was, it was wild in those days. It was just a, yeah. There wasn't much hard drugs, it was all just marijuana. Marijuana or an alcohol is the fisherman's lot. Certainly was not, not the pub to come to if you were a family sort of person. Girls dancing naked on the bar. I was only a bit of a kid and you know kids didn't tend to go down to all those pubs and that down that area much. It was a fairly dodgy area <laughs> in the early days. The Americans when they were here in the Second World War and I think the Air Force stayed here for about three months. They, they commandeered the license of the hotel yeah. and operated out of the out of the top floor of the hotel. So that was their accommodation yeah. and then um, yeah, so the Barbary Coast, what the Americans felt was it was a bit like New Orleans, a lot of indigenous or black people, and they said, gee, this reminds us of home, of, of New Orleans, the Barbary Coast, hence that name sticked. And it was n notorious for being the seedy end of town and very rough and a lot of fishing and all that sort of stuff, so it was yeah, considered to be reminiscent of the Barbary Coast and New Orleans. Broadly, uh, the Barbary Coast was a section of land opposite the Cairns Wharves. I first went to Cairns when I was 18. A mate and I, Jeff Blackman, end of the cray season, just got our licences. We were off to see the east coast of Australia, up to Cairns in a week. Anyway, we had a drink at a pub. Little did I know then, that pub was on the Barbary Coast. It wasn't until 50 years later, when I was doing the doco on the pearl shell divers off Torres Strait, that another friend, told me of the wild Cairns waterfront and its history. It sounded like an interesting story, I thought, and slipped it into the memory bank. It was only this year that I got around to doing something about it. By good fortune, I more or less stumbled onto the Barbary Coast Bar at the Barrier Reef Hotel, the last old pub on the coast. A little bit of history nestled amongst the high rise. I realised this was the very pub we drank at 61 years ago, and here I met the helpful licensees, Dennis and Donna Marr, who kindly showed me some of their memorabilia. Um, what I know about the Barbary Coast is I'm from Gordonvale originally, um, played a lot of sports in Cairns, and when we'd do raffles and everything along, along the, uh, the front of the the Barbary Coast here, we would certainly not come into this hotel. We'd go to the Big O or the Quaiturian either side of this hotel. This was a bit, a bit of a rough, rough area. So in the early days, there was uh, fishermen, trawlermen, um, waterside banana, workers. Sorry, waterside workers. Yeah, plenty of that. Uh, obviously, sugar and gold, that sort of thing, that used to be big uh, in Cairns, and also tin, tin mining. The original Barbary Coast was the lawless coast of North Africa, a place of pirates, slavery and blood and guts. I wonder if it's derived from the word barbaric or barbarism. During the gold rush days of the 1840s and 50s, the San Francisco waterfront was also dubbed the Barbary Coast due to the lawlessness that went on. There have been two old movies titled The Barbary Coast and there are at least two books. There's a casino at Las Vegas named the Barbary Coast, though it's a long way from the coast, and apparently the New Orleans port area gained the name as well. Anyway, Australia had one too, though hardly applicable today. By the early 1990s, the wharfies were gone due to containerisation, but it had been a bustling port, employing hundreds of waterside workers, predictably with a strong labour leaning. There was over a thousand waterside workers that worked in the port of Cairns and they had their own waterside workers hall and the, that was a, a meeting room. Uh, a lot of union meetings were held there, not only for the waterside workers union, but other, other unions that were working in Cairns at the time would use that as a meeting room. My dad was very much a unionist. He was a seaman. 
Uh, he worked on the boats, he was on, on the dredge, but he was in the Navy. Um, and uh, so he worked up and down the coast. So he, he hung out at the Barbary Coast a bit. Uh, he was very much a unionist and there was a union hall down there as well. I used to meet at the Harbour Board Hall quite a bit. So uh, it was more the Harbour Board Hall that I would go to. <laughs> it had a lovely dance floor. And uh, I, when I was a young fella in the, from the 60s on, uh, we had a, 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 a couple of really great bands in Cairns that provided the dance music and I loved to go there and, and Friday night was a big night. We used to sing a lot for the unions down there, you know, Kumbaya and We Shall Overcome and all those songs, you know, it was, it was in the 60s. Uh, we used to do Peter, Paul and Mary and Mamas and Papas and all those, quite a lot of protest songs, Pete Seeger and those sorts of songs as well. The workers used to participate in the May Day parades or any other occasion, they would walk, they would march as a group, uh, and uh, like the Fun in the Sun festivals, they would be prominent in uh, having a float in the very early, early festivals. We also, as children, we used to go along to the May Day processions with the family, all the family got together, and uh, um, there was a gentleman there, I think his surname was Bell, he used to organise a big uh, float and all the kids would get together on the float and we'd all go down to the parade. The Barbary Coast changed and evolved over time. There was a period when the pubs were open 24 hours a day. They used to operate three eight-hour shifts of the sugar terminal with the cane trains all coming through and delivering the sugar. Um, and so the hotel opened 24 hours a day to cater for the three eight-hour shifts. It, that was in the 20s. It was also a major sugar riot when they try to change those hours because the sugar wasn't moving quick enough out and the farmers weren't getting paid. So they actually had a huge ride along here and a guy um, was, uh, tried to shoot the police and mm. yes. When Jeff Blackman and I were here in 63, we walked into a bar where there was all black people, all islanders. Coming from Victoria, we were taken aback. It was outside our experience. We went elsewhere. So in the early days, they had segregated bars, as in, um, say, a bar had all cages and they put beer through little slots that have black people weren't allowed in the public bar or in the lounge. They had to have their own bar and a hotel. Um, a hotel that I worked in was called the Snake Pit. And what happened was, I remember one day, this dark gentleman was sitting in the lounge looking to buy a meal and have a drink. The publican comes through at the time and uh, one of the girls who was serving him said, I can't serve you in here, you have to go back to your own bar. As she rung the publican, he came down, had a talk to him and he obviously changed his, his um, ideas about it because what happened was it was uh, Senator Neville Bonner. It was the days that, that uh, black could come into the white bars and then women were allowed to come into the public bar as well. They tell me there were some formidable barmaids on the Barbary Coast such as Dottie Darwin and Mrs Fisher. I remember Dottie Darwin, she was behind the bar in the Criterion I think. Yeah she was a, a hard taskmaster, you didn't get anything past her but she did allow them to deal dope from behind the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or she didn't know about it, but she had to know about it. <laughs> the Barrier Reef Hotel at the time uh, was run by um, a Mrs. F Fisher. She married, a, she was a Japanese lady who married a um, Australian serviceman in Japan. He brought her here and I remember one, she used to get dressed in a kimono and walk up and down on the bar and try to get everyone else to buy more beer sort of thing. Had an alleyway down the side here called Blood Alley and all the fights used to happen down that alley. The lady that ran at Kay Fisher, and this is in some newspaper article that I read, um, used to take those that wanted to fight down there, let them have a, have a go under the fighting tree and then once the fight was over, they'd shake hands and come back in and keep drinking. Yeah. So. Uh, just just the, the big O, just a recollection while we're walking around. 
was uh, we used to go down there on a Friday afternoon and try and get in, have a beer. And there used to be a lady, Jan, that used to be the publican down there. And she was probably about five foot tall and probably about as wide as she was tall. And she had a very, very loud voice. Um, they used to have uh, a Fijian and a Samoan boy on the, on the door because there used to always be trouble. And these guys were about six foot six, tattoos, and looked like they could eat, eat your baby sort of thing, you know what I mean? But what, um, I'd be more scared of Jan than I would of those boys. I could handle them, but I couldn't handle Jan. If she yelled at you, you'd be out of there straight away. Oh, I have a beard in one hotel there. And this friend of mine who I knew quite well, reasoned me well, I used to talk to him and so forth. And he used to just come in and he had a newspaper and he's down, yeah, and he's, oh, daily, and he goes, yes, I have a beer, Steve, you know, and have a beer, so forth. And, uh, and I didn't realise that uh, inside his newspaper was an iron bar. Yeah. And, uh, an iron bar wrapped up in the newspaper. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he was there to belt a couple of people. Yeah. And because well, his name was Steve Nitkis, he was pretty well known, sort of a, a heavy out of, out of Sydney. Yeah. But he was quite a nice guy. But you, you never knew who you'd run into down there. It was With the introduction of containerisation requiring less labour, the pub scene was changing. From wharfies and beer to prawn fishermen, bikies, backpackers, tourists and drugs. Drugs were a big thing in those days. It was huge. And uh, we had so much uh, shipping coming in from from, especially from New Guinea and all that, there's so much, I, I, personal friends of mine are running luggers and bring loads of marijuana and stuff down. And this was happening all the time. And there's people who've been shot with them. I mean, um, Johnny Indonesia, he shot two people with a shotgun because they were knocking some of his stuff off from, and the, these are well-known people on the, on, the, on the Barbary Coast in those days. I remember Johnny Indonesia or Indo, he was, a very well-known identity. Everybody knew Window and um, a big party boy. We used to go across the waterworks before they pulled it down in between sessions on Sunday and ride the, the water slides drunk in a great group of people. No rules. It was, yeah, it was great fun. You, know, you could always get marijuana and there's a little laneway area between the Oceanic and the Criterium where the, the dope dealer used to stash his his stuff behind the bar in the forest bar probably and you could go in there and and buy what you needed from them there wasn't much hard drugs it was all just marijuana marijuana and alcohol is the fisherman's lot to, for my memory anyway it reminded me of Belmain all these little pubs like built out of brick and stone and that and just these little pubs all in a row about I don't know six of them or more on one block. I said, go and ask him for a gig. So he did, and they said, nah, we don't hire bands. And so I said, Johnny, get down there, tell them we'll do a gig on the on the um, worst night they've got for free. And they went, oh, all right. And so they agreed to that. They said, yeah, let these silly buggers have a go. And do you remember what happened the first night? Yeah, yeah. What happened? A pack full of people. Yeah. And uh, we were playing yeah. in the corner. Yeah. We set up, there's no stage. Which pub was that? It was called the Forest Bar. Oh, uh, the, the pub was called Criterion. That's right. And yeah. the, the, bar, the bar was called the Forest Bar. It was just a bar, a little bar. And it wasn't long he changed the name to the Pirate Bar because... For he, the pirates? Because all the people went there, we, they got out of control with the, <laughs> with the fishermen and the bikies and the drugs. <laughs> and had to go at the Pirate Bar. <laughs> When, when we went in there... Remember that? He got up on yeah. stage and he said, you're going to change the name of the place <laughs> to the Pirate Bar because you're all pi you're all fishermen. That, you're not hippies, are you? Who was that, the boss of the pub? What was yeah. his name? Yeah, Ger uh, Jerry Stapleton. Jerry Stapleton. Oh, yeah, OK. What about Harry? Wasn't it, was it Diamond Tooth Harry or something? He was next door. He oh, was in the Aussie. There's another oh, yeah, the Aussie, right. Aussie. Yeah, that was the Australian he, hotel. Everyone thought he was crazy, but he wasn't because he ran a a male strip show, and they said, everyone goes, oh, well, that'll be no good. Of course, all the women went to that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we all wanted to go to that too then. <laughs> I think when we went there, they used to talk about the old Barbary Coast, what it was like, 
and uh, it was, I think we gave it a second revival because it was a bit quiet uh, before we started playing there. There was no music. Oh, there was, there was another little pub they turned to a nightclub called, uh, was that Caesars or something like that? Caesars Palace. And they used to bring up, us, uh, you know, pop bands from down south. and Flashing dance floor. Yeah, it was a bit sort of... Like uh, John Travolta, it came out around the same time as the John Travolta yeah. movie. Oh. Had a flashing dance floor, those little squares, all coloured lights from them. So basically when we went in there, it was a pretty dead place really, I think. It was next door to where we were. There was not much happening all up the, all up the Barbary Coast. Then when we played there the first night, it was just, there was too many people to fit in the room because they all come from all the other pubs and just went, wow, what's this? And then Jerry or Harry, or who was it, Jerry come up at the end of the night and said, okay, you guys, I want you every night of the week. And we went, oh, I don't know about that. So we negotiated a deal where we had Monday, Tuesday off, and we played all the other nights. But that soon developed into a Sunday afternoon gong show. That was legendary. We invited everybody to get up and have a go with the band backing them up. The John O's Blues Bar and the Forest Bar had a gong show on Sundays. And there were four of us that got up on stage. Um, Peter Holmes was one. My partner, Tom Davies, was another. I can't remember who else was there. And we did a political spiel. I represented Maggie Thatcher and someone else was Reagan and someone else was Bob Hawke. And we did our political bit and at the end of it all said, and this is what we think of world politics, and turned around and dropped our duds and brown-eyed the whole audience. And we won the, won the gong show. <laughs> what did you win? We won a carton of beer. <laughs> we were in the gong show, remember? Yeah, 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 I do. And that was like a talent contest. And get this, the first prize, you all love this story, was 15 cartons of beer. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we said, what's all that stuff on the stage, you guys? They said, the boss came up here and he said, oh, that's the first prize for the for the, for the the gong show. Yeah, the talent contest. Yeah, the young Aborigine guy won it. Mm. Yeah, and then the renegades helped him to a, took him to a party after that. <laughs> Pretty funny. If, imagine giving someone 15 cartons of grog yeah. now. The that was a prize. <laughs> yeah, imagine trying to, try to give that away as a prize now. The Barbary Coast over the other side, my memory was that it was, it was just a really rough, dodgy area to go to. You know? um, I used to go to the Criterion when I was in my 20s, I'd go to the Criterion. There was always good bands playing there. What about the rights with the coppers when the coppers came in? <laughs> uh, yeah, we used to run Spot the Narc contest <laughs> at that pub. Mm. It wasn't my idea. No, of course not. Of course, so there was no, of course. <laughs> There were narcs around in the audience. They used to disappear real quick when there was a Spot the Narc contest on. <laughs> spot the Narc was just to keep your eyes peeled for someone who was likely to come in and bust you for dealing dope in the pub. Because they're all smokers. So it was just Spot the Narc. <laughs> like I say, you used to go to the Criterion. Um, there was a band there. This is back in the late 70s, 80s, there was a band there called John O's Blues Band, played at the Criterion. You could get lots of stories about that. But it was still, it was still really rough, you know, still like lots of dancing on tables and all that sort of stuff, you know. It was great. We had a great time there. It was really good fun. But, uh, yeah, I was a pretty good girl, though. You know, I just went, oh, had a few drinks and watched. <laughs> Carmel, I played with her for a while in a band, actually. Not, not there, but uh, Carmel, uh, Carmel Webb. They had a little family band sort of thing, you know. They were called the Web, the Web Trio. Yeah, yeah, there was her sister and her brother. And then she made other bands. Uh, and one of those bands I joined in on guitar for a while. So what do you have? You had the Criterion was the first pub. That's where we were. And then next to it was the, the Aussie, the Australian, which had, um, they had a band in sort of a country rock band. I can't remember. And then next to that, I think, was Caesars, which was another old pub turned into Caesar nightclub. And then next to that was the the Barry last. Lee. Yeah, they were the last one to put bands on, but they built a little sort of a room on the side, and we played there a bit. I got photos of us playing there. And then next to that became that was the Big O. The Big O was a standard thing, but it used to only go Saturday or Sunday afternoon. Yeah, the Big O was a big thing at the Big O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to play, I remember the song we used to play, Midnight Rambler, you know. 
talk him up the midnight rain because he's good to dance, you see. Mick Jagger. Yeah, that's the rhythm. We used to play that one because of the rhythm, you know, and they used to dance at the big O in the Oceanic. We used to have the, the Barbary Coast Olympics. And they used to have funny games that the people had to play. And they, the coconut, get a coconut shot, put the coconut thing, or mm. uh, they had all funny things, uh, like, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Who could eat the bananas the quickest and all sorts of funny things like that, you know? Yeah, the Greasy Pig event was something that they would have at a picnic where they would grease a, a young piglet up, and whoever could catch it won a prize. And we used to let these Grease pigs go. <laughs> Chasing these pigs up and through hotels and through things. And we, there'd be mud wrestling on at one hotel. And I was just, a, and all the girls would be in there and yeah, they'd be being paid and boys would be betting on the, the mud wrestling scenes. But the mud wrestling was a separate thing, wasn't it? Mud wrestling was different. Mm. It was out the back. Yeah. And the guy uh, always remembered that I was supposed to be organising and I had a microphone said, Everybody who wants to take on these girls in the mud wrestling, because the girls are real beautiful, they're in bikinis and they're standing there. He going, oh, he wouldn't mind wrestling her, everybody's saying that. And some guy, a drunk guy from Mariba, he reckoned, yeah, he wanted to wrestle them. And whatever happened, he they, he got in, they all jumped in the mud and the girl lost the, lost the top or something. And the, the place was surrounded by police and, and they came in and arrested the guy that was in the mass wrestling. And they said, where's the guy doing the, doing the, doing the talking? The MC. Said, that, 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 that was me. They said, oh no, he's in his car driving out towards the beach somewhere. <laughs> he's not here at all. But one of the things that Cairns was notorious for then was that every one of the people that spent time drinking in those three hotels got horribly drunk. And the reason for it was that we, uh, Cairns used to have its own brewery Northern Australian breweries um, in, in Spence Street and uh, the alcohol content of the beer of Cairns, uh, Cairns uh, Draft or Cairns Bitter Ale or North Queensland Lager was uh, 5.7 I think it was so you know if you had a belly full of that you're horribly drunk and a lot of the sailors that, uh, were, that drank there had difficulty getting back to the, their ships and had to get help back on board. Because we were living on prawn trawlers that were tied up at the main wharf in those days and they'd be three or four abreast on the, on the main wharf and the wharf sheds there was a great spot for network because it was undercover so we could string the nets out, there's plenty of poles to tie nets to and we'd all do network there. And then by 10 o'clock you've had enough of that and maybe 11 o'clock and be off the cross the road to the pubs in the Barbary Coast. Either the, usually for us it was the Criterion or the Aussie. And then the bands would start playing at night and yeah, we had a great time. We'd all be pissed by four o'clock in the afternoon and drinking all sorts of weird and wonderful things. <laughs> it gradually changed when we were there. We played for about five years straight pretty well every day, pretty well. But the backpackers were just starting to come to Cairns. Yeah, and not many tourists. No, uh, and the backpackers had found it and there was, we always had uh, lots of nice backpacker girls because we were young men in our prime at the time and we thought, wow, this is all right. So you had a mixture of backpackers and locals and prawn fishermen and leftover crocodile shooters who weren't supposed to be, but there was still a few around. And uh, it wasn't long before the other pubs, the other five or so, thought, well, they're all going to the Criterion, the Pirates Bar, because John is there. So they all started to put on bands. And before long, within about six months, I'd say there was one, two, three, about five band, five, five of the pubs had bands on all the time. So you could walk in one pub, into the next one, into the next one, it was a different band in every one. And uh, it made for a very active music scene. And I think the big thing in those days, there wasn't enough bands to go around. Do you remember the night the cops raided? They came in just before closing time and tried to take the drinks out of the fishermen's hands. Well, I don't know. Um, oh, no, by that time of night, Jono was pretty into champagne in those days. So at the end of the night, you might remember a few things. 
But the cops all turned up, a whole bunch of them come in about quarter to 12, because you had to shut at 12. And they started taking the drinks out of the fishermen's hands because, you know, that's it. Wow, you'll never see anything like it in your life. The fishermen just exploded and it turned into a huge free-for-all. And do you, can you remember when uh, one of the um, copper's hats ended up behind the drum kit? Because of everything was going up in the air and everything like that. you remember that? No, oh, mm. no. end of the night, John o. I remember the good things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the fishermen didn't drink beer, they drank spirits. They'd buy a jug of chocolate soldiers, which was a lot of rum and Kahlua and milk, or they'd just buy rum and Coke in a jug and there was more spirit drinking than beer drinking because everyone had just so much money. It used to close at, at, uh, Let at 12 o'clock. 11 o'clock, real early. Yeah, yeah, 12 11 o'clock. Everybody had 11? told to go home at 11 o'clock. Yeah. I, That's what I thought used to be funny. I thought it was 12, it, but it might be. Real been wild, John. Yeah. I said, everyone, closing time. It's like a George Sorogood yeah. sort of like clock on the wall says so, so last call for alcohol. <laughs> but you know yeah. what? Because it shut so early, everybody was on a real high at closing time, rah, ready to rage. And we'd say, stop see you tomorrow night and they'd all come back the next night because they were sort of left up in the air which wasn't a bad nowadays they go through till five in the morning and everybody's oh look going out tomorrow that sort of thing you know um i reckon i probably had some of the best times of my life during that period um it was just fun playing virtually every day and the reaction from the crowd was always terrific they loved what we did there was always new people, new people you miss meeting. There was lots of young girls suddenly descending on cans that, that wanted to um, have a cup of tea in our house, which was in the middle of the CBD. And, and I think it was, yeah, I had a ball. Oh, I enjoyed it. No, and you will get the occasional pierce and will say, oh, Barbary Coast, war, dangerous. It wasn't to us. We never got, never got picked on ever. And we basically had a ball for you the whole time we played there. Not bad. When other bands, if, other, ba like that. if other bands came to Kansas to do concerts, uh, they would pretty well always head down to see John O on the Barbary Coast. When yeah, the Sydney band that played at uh, uh, Caesar's Palace, they were good. They were called Shazam. Shazam, yeah, I remember them. Uh, but remember Peter, the singer. Yeah, but who got up and jammed in the forest Shazam. bar? There was Ian Moss got up and jammed with us. Jimmy. Yeah. Jimmy Barnes, uh, they would come down and hop up in the last set and have a big jam. And pretty well anybody that was in town doing a concert somewhere, they would race down to get in on them because it was just such a wild scene going on. It was like, wow, let's get into this, you know. But uh, yeah, no, it was all good fun. It was great. The rooms were so much colder than our father was a soldier. When I was young, met my first lover, I was 17, she was brown, I was pretty green, such a good time when I was young.